Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Tom Morgan, and uh, I'm uh, the director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at the College of St. Scholastica. Uh, as I think most of you know, this is the second in a series of programs we're doing this year on the topic, Is Religion a Force for Good or Ill? Uh, and I want to right now thank all of our sponsors for helping to make this, these programs possible. In particular, of course, the Allworth family and the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at the college, and also the Warner Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund, the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Ivra Foundation, and by Mary C. Van Ivra in memory of William Van Ivra, a former trustee of the college. Additional support has been received for this lecture from the Royal D. Allworth Jr. Institute at the University of Minnesota Duluth, Reader Weekly of Duluth, and from other private donors. My thanks, as always, to all of you for helping to make these programs possible. Um, as, as, you, as I told you, the, um, the theme this year for the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice is, uh, is religion, and is it a force for good or ill? Um, there's another center here at the college that is much more focused on religion than the Alra Center, and that is the, um, the Auric Alprin Interreligious Forum, and the programming uh, the Interreligious Forum is doing is intended to complement what we're doing here at the Alra Center, and so I bring to your attention the fact that in, on Tuesday, November 11th, we will have a, a talk by Sister Simone Campbell. She's the director of Network Social Justice Lobby. She is, excuse me, <clears throat> I think more well known as the head nun on the Nuns on the Bus group. And she will be here for, for an evening talk and also informal discussion about social justice activism uh, and a variety of programs during the day before the talk on November 10th. So you might keep that in mind as well. And by the way, if you want to be on our mailing list for other programming in the future, there's a place to get your name uh, registered with us out in the lobby and, and then you'll get all these nice postcards in the future and other information from us. Um, after today's lecture, um, you are invited next week to come and talk about it with uh, one of my colleagues, Daryl Dietrich, uh, professor of psychology here at the college. And the time and place and Daryl's credentials are all on one of these sheets. If you didn't get one, I hope uh, you pick one up in the lobby. Uh, uh, that's on the 28th of October. Those conversations are always interesting to me as well. Um, by the way, one other little housekeeping announcement. Um, as usual, after Ms. Jacoby's talk, we'll have Q&A, and we'd like to uh, allow the students to go first. So please, community people, allow the students to ask the questions first, and then if there's time, you, of course, are welcome to ask questions. Um, behind me, uh, I think you've noticed is a picture. This is the second annual, that's Martha Allworth behind me, and um, this is the second annual Martha Allworth Memorial Lecture. Um, I knew Martha pretty well, but there's a, a person in the audience who knew her much better than I ever did, so I'd like to invite this person up to the podium now and say a few words about her grandmother, Emily Allworth, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Allworth, and welcome to the second annual Martha B. Allworth Memorial Lecture here at the Allworth, Study, the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice. I was asked to say a few words about the extraordinary woman that my grandmother was. She was a lifelong learner, a world traveler, and a passionate social activist. And while I knew her as a woman who always wore pink lipstick and had a freezer full of chocolate ice cream bars, to this community she was another kind of treasure. 
ever the community advocate. She served on the boards of the College of St. Scholastica, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, the League of Women's Voters, Junior League, Building for Women, Grandmothers for Peace, and even more. A true citizen of the world, she began her early education in Switzerland and Italy, but she, her sister, and her mother were forced to flee to France in 1939 as Hitler was preparing to invade Poland. They left Europe on the last civilian voyage of the Queen Mary, zigzagging across the Atlantic Ocean to avoid the German U-boats. After returning to America, she attended Stanbrook Hall here on campus, part of the St. Scholastica Mon Monastery. And in 1947, she graduated from Smith College. Lifelong learning was probably her biggest passion. She furthered her own education at UMD's University for Seniors, where she was a founding member and taught and took classes for 24 years. She founded the Royal D. Allworth Jr. Institute for International Studies at UMD in memory of her husband and was an early and constant supporter of, of the Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at St. Scholastica. These programs ensure that future generations have access to interesting and influential people and have a unique way to stay informed about the happenings of the world. So each year our family selects a lecture in the Peace and Justice series to reflect who Martha Allworth was and one that honors her memory. My grandmother stood up for what she believed in and never shied away from controversy. She was a proud woman and a role model for peace and social justice. And I hope that you'll agree with me that we made the right choice with tonight's lecture because I know that she would have enjoyed hearing what our speaker will have to say this evening. I'll finish with one of my favorite stories about her. As I mentioned, she attended University for Seniors classes at UMD. She was also extremely hard of hearing, and hearing aids didn't work very well for her, so she used earbuds and a small amplifier that she'd pinned to her shirt and uh, looked a bit like a small MP3 player. She called it her iPod. <laughs> and while on campus, she wanted to be prepared in case a student asked her what she was listening to. So she memorized the name of a popular rapper. <laughs> Little Wayne, she told me. And for those of you not familiar with his music, he is an unsavory lyricist. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight and honoring the memory of my grandmother. And I hope you all enjoy the lecture. Yes, as I said, I knew Martha as well, and I always felt very supported by her in some of the projects that I was involved in. Our speaker this evening uh, began her career as a reporter for the Washington Post and has been a contributor to a variety of uh, national publications, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the American Prospect, The Nation, Newsday, Mother Jones, Glamour, and AARP magazine, quite a list. And for many years, she wrote a regular column called The Spirited Atheist for a Washington Post Newsweek blog on religion. Raised in a Roman Catholic home in Michigan, Ms. Jacoby was 18 before she learned that her father had been born into a Jewish family. She explored these roots in 2000 in her book, Half Jew, a daughter's search for her family's buried past. Her book, Free Thinkers, A History of American Secularism, was named a notable book by, uh, in 2004 by the Washington Post and the New York Times, and it also was named an Outstanding International Book of the Year by the Times Literary Supplement of London and by The Guardian. Our speaker's previous books include Moscow Conversations, based on her experiences in Moscow from 1969 to 1971. Another book is uh, Wild Justice, The Evolution of Revenge, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 1984. More recently, she's published The Great Agnostic, Robert Ingersoll and American Free Thought, and the Age of American Unreason, and Never Say Die, The Myth of the New Old Age, and Alger Hiss and the Battle for History. 
Now she's putting the finishing touches on her latest book, Religious Conversion, A Secular History, and this book is expected to be out in the fall. Her recent honors include a Distinguished Achiever Award from the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Richard Dawkins Award by Atheist Alliance International. Our speaker lives in New York City, where she was program director of the New York branch of the Center for Inquiry, an organization whose mission is to foster a secular society based on science, reason, freedom of inquiry, and humanistic values. When she's not thinking about these very serious things or writing books, our speaker enjoys watching baseball. She's currently particularly interested in the New York Mets and the Kansas City Royals, and she tells me that she'd also root for the Twins if she was given the chance. <laughs> but <clears throat> besides baseball, she takes a special interest in Renaissance art. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Susan Jacoby. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, the published title of this speech is, is Christianity good for politics? I think we might expand this to, is religion good for politics? Now, I must admit, the question is so broad that it's pretty much the equivalent of, is religion good for sex? <laughs> because the first thing that comes to mind is what kind of religion, immediately followed by what kind of sex? And you could certainly say exactly the same thing about the relationship between religion and politics in our own country around the world. And around the world. Uh, I would like to thank Tom Morgan and the Allworth family for inviting me to deliver this speech at a historically Catholic college. Since, as you know, uh, I am historically Catholic myself. Uh, <laughs> that my personal history and intellectual journey led me to atheism does not make this less so. If those Dominican nuns hadn't drilled the Baltimore Catechism into me, I probably wouldn't have wound up reading the Bible, Augustine, Spinoza, or Thomas Paine, all of which certainly contributed in different ways to the formation of the story of the conscience of an atheist. But that is a story for another day. One reason I do particularly enjoy speaking at historically religious colleges with strong academics is that the students tend to know more about what I'm talking about. Not because all of them are Catholics at a Catholic college, I know you're all not, or Jews at a Jewish college, or Lutherans at a Lutheran college, but because these institutions tend to pay particular attention to the many forms of religious and secular thought that have gone into the making of our political system and others. And I must admit that there is another naughty reason I particularly enjoy speaking at Catholic colleges. And that's because the independence of American Catholic colleges, rather like the independence of American nuns, really annoyed the Vatican under Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI. And I like to think that events like the one this evening are part of what annoyed those last two popes. And I like to think of myself as just one small, a little irritating speck in that universe. Now, unfortunately for my vanity, Pope Francis seems to be more open-minded about almost everything so far, by the way, than except those uppity nuns than his immediate predecessors. Somehow, though, I have a feeling that as the first Jesuit pope, he's not going to use his energies to criticize intellectually rigorous Catholic institutions of higher education. Why, I'll bet when he makes his first pontifical visit to the United States, he might even have a friendly dinner with representatives of those heretical colleges. But I digress. First, let's get to a working definition of politics by which I mean what the framers of the Constitution would have called civil society, as distinct from that part of society that clearly lies within the realm of religion. Civil society, or politics, if you will, includes all of the arrangements by which human beings govern themselves. For thousands of years, until roughly 300 years ago in the West, civil and religious society were basically one and the same. Unfaithfulness to a particular religion was treason to the state, 
and heresy was a crime. Yet we do have along the way glimmerings of change even in absolute monarchies that were closely tied to a particular religion. When Queen Elizabeth I of England famously said, I have no desire to make windows into men's souls, she was articulating an idea that had no real legal basis in a world where just about everyone still believed in the divine right of kings. Now, she didn't really mean this when she said it. She was a famous busybody, as any effective monarch had to be, and was quite prepared to authorize torture to make those windows into the souls of anyone she suspected of being traitorous to her. What she was really saying was, if you don't bother my government with your religion, I won't bother your religion with my government. And at the time, that was actually an advance for both religion and government, although, of course, the Church of Rome didn't quite see it that way. It took another two centuries, give or take 50 years, for the whole issue of church and state, or if you prefer, religion and politics, to take a definitively different turn. When it did, it happened in part because of the English colonization of the New World that began with the explorers Elizabeth sent across the ocean. Now, one of the saddest facts about American elementary and secondary education today some of us were talking about at dinner, is that most graduates of our public elementary and secondary schools emerge filled with myths about our country's origins and completely ignorant of the noble process by which church and state were separated in our nation for the first time in the history of the world. The first myth is that the separation of church and state is bad because it keeps religious discourse out of the public square. That is emphatically not what separation of church and state means. Religious discourse has always been a part of many of our political debates. What it does mean is that you and I don't get to write our particular religious views or any obeisance to any religion into law. Now the second myth is that America right from the start was founded on freedom from religious persecution. This myth is actually true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go very far. That the early settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony promptly started to persecute those who did not agree with their brand of Puritanism is simply ignored in a lot of history lessons. Uh, in Texas, for instance, the State Board of Education removed Anne Hutchinson from its text on colonial New England. Just another one of those uppity women who think they have a right to talk about religion. The only difference between Massachusetts and the Old World was that in the New World, there was ample land for religious dissidents like Hutchinson and Roger Williams to be expelled and set up shop, well, elsewhere, in their case, in Rhode Island, rather than winding up in prison or in an auto de fe as they would have on the other side of the ocean. Massachusetts was a theocracy. And that is another word that the Christian right hates, unless, of course, it's implied only to Muslim theocracies. In fact, the role that the Christian right has played in the battle to censor the secular side of American history is a perfect example of the dangers of talking about Christianity or any religion, for that matter, as if it were a monolith. I dare say that the vast majority of people in this room tonight are Christians. But I doubt that you're the kind of Christians who want to censor textbooks. And the dangers of that kind of generalization apply to subdivisions within religion, too. If this talk were titled, Is Catholicism Good for Politics?, you would certainly have to define what kind of Catholicism you're talking about. That wouldn't have been true 125 years ago, but it's certainly true today. As the, authors of Free Thinkers, as the author of Free Thinkers, A History of American Secularism, I owe a great debt to a Jesuit scholar, Father Thomas E. Buckley, for his book, Church and Stay in Revolutionary Virginia, which I hope some of you will come across in one of your religious history courses eventually, which offers the definitive account of the 18th century alliance between Enlightenment free thinkers and evangelical Christians, mainly Baptists, this agreement produced in 1786 the first state law establishing the separation of government from institutional religion. The Religious Freedom Act was written by James Madison and was passed in opposition to a proposal by Patrick Henry. Yes, 
that Patrick Henry, the one who said, give me liberty or give me death. But what he wanted was to impose a tax in Virginia for the support of religious teaching in public schools. The Baptists opposed the tax because they feared government interference with religion. The free thinkers because they feared religious interference with government. Now the date of this Virginia law is extremely important because it was passed just a year before the former revolutionaries gathered in Philadelphia to write the federal constitution. At that moment, Virginia stood alone among the states in prohibiting religious tests for public office. Maryland allowed both Catholics and Protestants, but not deists or Jews to hold office. New York gave its imprimatur, you should excuse the expression, to Protestants, Jews, and deists, but not to Catholics in office. Connecticut and Massachusetts proved to be the most intransigent states of all on this issue, with Connecticut waiting until 1843, until it became the last state to drop its civil restrictions on Jews. The point is that the men who wrote the Constitution could have ordered the model of the new federal government along the lines of the past and the lines of many existing state laws and entangled religion with government. Instead, the framers took the Virginia Religious Freedom Law as their model. When I say that the founders established a secular government, I don't mean to imply that they were either hostile to or unmindful of religion. On the contrary, the experience of the old world had convinced them that there could be no liberty of conscience or any other kind of liberty for that matter if the state was an instrument of religion or vice versa. And so that is why they left any reference to God out of the Constitution, an inconvenient fact that those who claimed America was founded as a Christian nation can never, ever get around. But they keep trying. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who to use an old phrase is more Catholic than the Pope, or at least more Catholic than any Pope since Pius IX in the 19th century, he could not have been more wrong, not Pius IX, although he couldn't have been more wrong either, but Scalia couldn't have been more wrong in his dissent in one of what were called the Ten Commandments cases in 2005, when he wrote that the Constitution clearly permits, quote, disregard of polytheists and believers in unconcerned deities, just as it permits the disregard of devout atheists. Now, the Constitution permits no such thing. It has absolutely nothing, nothing, to say about God, gods, or any form of belief or non-belief, apart from its sweeping prohibition against, in Article 6 against any religious test for public office and the First Amendment's familiar declaration that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. If the founders had intended to disregard the rights of people who don't believe in a conventional God, they would have said something like, mm, there shall be no religious test for public office. As long as you believe in one God whose eye is on the sparrow, as long as you're not a deist, an atheist, or even worse, a Unitarian. <laughs> the separation of church and state is not some sort of made up mumbo jumbo. It lies at the heart, very heart of what it means to be an American. The idea that faith is not a requirement for citizenship. Patriotic loyalty is possible to one's country without adherence to a particular faith or any faith. And this idea has served American government and religion beautifully for more than two centuries. Uh, many religions have flourished here and continue to flourish at a time when religion is in real trouble in the world's other industrialized nations, especially in what has sometimes been called post-Christian Europe. Why in heaven? or more to the point on earth? Would anyone want to change an arrangement that has worked so well for so long? Justice Scalia said something even more revealing than his opinion in the Ten Commandments case in a speech on the death penalty at the University of Chicago Divinity School in 2002. All just governments derive their power from God, he argued, and just as God has the power of life and death, so too do his representatives on earth. 
And I can't resist pointing out here that this stands the anti-death penalty argument of recent popes on its head. What those popes have said is the death penalty is wrong because only God has the power of life and death. In this rather astonishing speech, Scalia both bolstered his argument with the statement that, and I quote, few doubted the morality of the death penalty in an age that believed in the divine right of kings, unquote. It is easy, quote, to see the hand of the Almighty behind rulers whose forebears in the dim mists of history were supposedly anointed by God, who had obtained their thrones in awful and unpredictable battles, whose outcome was determined by the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Poor Justice Scalia. He just can't get over the fact that he was appointed to the nation's highest court, not by the Lord of hosts, but by President George W. Bush. <laughs> this argument embodies not only the kind of religion that is terrible for politics, but the kind of politics that is terrible for religion. Why, this line of thinking could actually be used to hold God responsible for the actions of politicians. I don't know how, if I were a believer, I would keep my faith if I believed that God was responsible for electing these feckless congressmen who are campaigning here now. And by here, I mean here, right here in Minnesota, as well as back in my home, New York City, instead of doing their duty to their country by debating the military actions we're now engaged in abroad. I might even be persuaded to think that religion was good for politics if being devoutly religious meant that our elected representatives felt just a little bit, bit uneasy about being on the campaign trail while Kurds and Christians and Muslims who don't agree with ISIS are burning in Syria. But no, the right-wingers who insist on waving the flag of religion in their politics at home are home now campaigning in their strongholds just as some secret atheist politicians who are too cowardly to own up to their real beliefs are campaigning in their districts and pretending that they're mm, just spiritual but not religious, never saying the A word. To return to the subject of what kind of religion is bad for politics or governance in a society like ours, I would say any kind of religion that appeals to divine authority to settle what are really social disagreements among human beings. Because God says so is the end, not the beginning of any rational political discourse. Because what is there to talk about when my God says something different from your God? In a society with no established church and no obligation to any form of religious beliefs, we can't decide matters like the death penalty or the right to contraception, or for that matter, on the basis of war and peace, on the basis of what someone's God supposedly wants. And I might add, anti-religious sentiment is equally irrelevant in the way these matters should be decided. In the United States, everything about the death penalty has to be decided on the basis of what the Bill of Rights and the Constitution say, not what Leviticus or Jesus or the Koran or Tom Paine, who was an early opponent of capital punishment, say. Does the death penalty constitute cruel and unusual punishment in the 20th century? Have those sentenced to death received equal protection under the law? In our constitutional republic, these issues have nothing whatsoever to do with God and should have nothing whatsoever to do them. They have to do with secular law under a government that derives its power from we the people. Unless you think I am picking on Judge Scalia, which I am, the reason I'm picking on him is that he's an outstanding example of someone who injects religion into politics in an Ill illegitimate way he exemplifies this precisely because he is a Supreme Court decision. This is not some stupid man. He knows better. He's allowed his religious, base, religious convictions on the death penalty here, for example, to overwhelm his knowledge of what the Constitution actually says. And I'd like to expand this beyond religion itself to the more general question of moral values, which was raised at uh, Denise's and my talk this noon. For the last decade or so, we've heard a great deal about the so-called values issue in American politics. This discussion actually has been based largely on one exit poll taken after the 2004 election in which 23% of voters said they regarded moral values as the country's preeminent issue. This reminds me of the Duchess's comment in Alice in Wonderland. 
tut, tut, child. Everything's got a moral if only you can find it. The truth is that we're all values voters. If we're talking about values in the proper sense, as ethical guidelines for the way we want to treat one another as citizens and how we relate to the rest of the world. And this too is part of the larger issue of what the relationship between politics and religion ought to be. But the phrase moral values as generally used by the media and far too many politicians usually has something to do with sex and nothing else. Gay marriage, abortions, condoms, abstinence only sex education programs, lewd pictures on the internet, even football players who have lots of children out of wedlock with lots of women, which I know you all in Minnesota who've been reading the recent news know about. Uh, politicians who preach about family values without dumping their own, with, with, while dumping their own first or second families. And a consistent aspect of this phenomenon is the use of religious politics and language to suggest that God himself has endorsed whatever governmental policy the speaker happens to be to favor. Conservative Republicans started it, but Democrats wanting to retake that moral real estate, if there is such a thing as moral real estate, are now using religious language every chance they get. Uh, the House Minority Leader, Representative Nancy Pelosi, once urged her fellow Democrats to vote against budget cuts and programs for the poor as an act of worship. What's wrong with that, you might say? Nothing if you're a religious person voicing your own opinion about the morality of various public policies. But there's everything wrong with politicians suggesting that the main reasons to vote against cuts in programs for the poor is because God demands it or the Bible says so in some of its passages. How about supporting help for the poor because it's what we all owe each other as decent human beings, whether we believe in God or not. It's been my observation that politicians start talking about the Bible, or rather their interpretation of the Bible, when they don't but want to bother making a case with facts. When you think about it, the, the claim that God is behind a particular program is not only antithetical to our secular constitutional traditions, it's also sacrilegious. One of the most frequently cited quote unquote biblical passages by right-wing politicians is God helps those who help themselves. There's only one little problem with this. There is no such passage in the Bible. Yet more than half of Americans in a Gallup poll believe that God who helps those, helps those who help themselves is a passage in the Bible. Of course, the same poll also showed that half of Americans can't name the four Gospels, a statistic I really actually didn't believe when I first saw it in a book, so I looked up the original poll before I came here, and yes, it's true. More than half of Americans can't name the four Gospels. <sighs> One thing is certain. An overwhelming majority of politicians in both parties are terrified of being labeled as secular, a dirty word, if they make a point of upholding the separation of church and state. So they don't. The conventional explanation for this timidity is that they're terrified by the financial and political power of the religious right. Now, right-wing money and religion have certainly driven the rise of what I call religious correctness during the last 30 years. It's much too easy to blame it exclusively on that. To paint the right wing as the sole actor in the demonization of American secularism evades the role of larger forces in American society and absolves secularists themselves of their responsibility to educate the public about the neglected secular heritage of this republic. Should emphasize here that by secularist, I don't necessarily mean atheists. All atheists are secularists, but by no means are all secularists atheists. I'm simply talking about people who believe in secular government and justification for public policies that lie within the realm of reason and nature rather than faith in the supernatural. Now, one essential factor in the demonization of secularism is the larger American public's unexamined assumption that religion per se is always a good thing. The ultra-conservative apostles of religious correctness have exploited that assumption brilliantly and succeeded in tiring opponents of faith-based adventurism as enemies of all religion, as atheists, as relativists, yet another demonized word. 
it takes a drastic example of religion's potential to do either public or private harm, say a fanatical right-wing Christian's assassination of a doctor who performs abortions, or the beheading of infidels in the name of radical Islam, to even shake the American faith in all religions as a positive thing. And here I come to a subject that cannot be avoided if we're to ask not only whether Christianity is good for politics, but whether religion in general is good for politics. And that's the violence being committed today by terrorists in the name of their concept of Islam. I thought a good deal of leaving this subject out of my speech because it's frankly explosive. And anyone who talks about it honestly is always vulnerable to being misunderstood. So I hope you'll listen carefully as I have tried to choose my words with extra care. The violence now being perpetrated on first and foremost Muslims who do not agree with the particular fanatical notion of Islam held by those thugs, on Christians in the Middle East, on ancient sects that combine elements of Zoroastrianism, Christianity, and Islam, and on atheists and free thinkers in countries like Bangladesh and Indonesia, is motivated by religious belief. The particular belief of these violent young men, coupled with a drive for political power to be achieved through violence. I want to say unequivocally for those who insist that violence has nothing to do with the real Islam, that this is as nonsensical as to say that the Crusades and the Inquisition had nothing to do with real Christianity, or that the murder of doctors who perform abortions have nothing to do with real, in this case, American Christianity today. They have nothing to do with your concept of Christianity. Just as ISIS has nothing to do with Islam as it is understood and practiced by millions of Muslims around the world. But to say that they have nothing to do with religion at all is a lie. The most nonsensical line taken by feckless, religiously correct people on the left is their frequent comparison between Christendom's crimes in the Middle Ages and the crimes of radical Islamists today. These people, in my view, have no right to call themselves liberals because the heart of liberalism is belief in the possibility, if not always the attainment, of progress. There is nothing liberal about suggesting that anyone, anywhere in the world, of whatever religious or non-religious persuasion should be forced to live in the 21st century by the standards of medieval theocracy for as long as it takes violent religious fanatics to cast, catch up with the last thousand years or so of history. This does not, I repeat, not mean that all or most Muslims sympathize with terrorists, but it is a fact that most terrorists in the world today are Muslims, that they are terrorists who have been condemned by many other Muslims, and that have killed and persecuted more Muslims who disagree with them than they have anyone else, is also a fact. Now, a man named Dean Obedala, a comedian and contributor to the Daily Beast, recently excoriated the media for using the adjective Islamic to describe any terrorist act. Why, he asked, does the press apply a double standard and fail to call the murderers of abortion doctors Christian terrorists? I don't know about anyone else, but I am perfectly comfortable applying the label Christian terrorist to the clinic bombers and the, doc and the killers of doctors who perform abortions. I've just done so here and I've done so in print and to say that they're motivated by their brand of Christianity is not to say that the majority of Christians agree with them. The difference is that these Christian terrorists go to jail in the United States under secular law for their crimes. What the separation of church and state means and why that kind of religion, that extreme kind of religion, isn't good for politics, what the separation of church and state means is you don't get to commit crimes against humanity in the name of any form of religion. And by the way, what could be more patronizing to Muslims than the idea that they are dumb enough to need, need, to need shielding from the fact that some of their worst enemies are Muslim terrorists? Malala Yousafzai, the co-recipient of this year's Nobel Peace Prize with a Hindu who has fought all his life against child slavery and labor, uh, Malala is a Muslim. Should she not be called a Muslim? because the Muslim Taliban who tried to murder her at age 15 might be offended? Or we do, do we identify the religion of good Muslims 
and only leave out the adjective Muslim when it applies to bad Muslims. Balderdash is a word I like to use. You don't get a chance to use that Victorian word anymore. The Enlightenment bashers on the religious and political right deserve as much contempt for their exploitation of this issue as religiously correct hypocrites on the left. Suddenly these people from the textbook censors in Texas to the Fox News pundits have discovered that Islamic terrorists hate our values. The very secular values that the political right has tried ceaselessly to eviscerate and write out of American history. And suddenly these people have discovered that Muslims, all Muslims, not just right-wing theocrats, lack respect for women's rights. Yes, the world would certainly be a paradise for women who want to control their own minds and bodies if the Christian right were in charge here and those pesky Muslims would all just disappear. As to the question of which I understand you had a speaker a few weeks ago who mentioned this, of why secularists single out religious violence and don't just talk about uh, violence, period, I would say that we refer to religious violence as specifically bad because religion claims to be in the business of setting moral and ethical standards. And in that respect, violence committed in the name of religion is particularly harmful to civil society in a way that, say, a nut who shoots children in a school is not harmful in the same context. The injury to the victims, of course, is the same. But at least the violent acts aren't being committed by people who claim to represent God. And the whole problem, of course, with religion and politics is not religion as a spiritual force, but religion melded with political ideology and political power. But even when religion is engaged in doing good, the founders of this nation had good reason to be suspicious of the promotion of any faith by taxpayer dollars. Some years ago, I spoke at a panel sponsored by the New Yorker magazine, and one of my fellow panelists was then the director of President Bush's White House Office of Faith-Based Programs, which I should say has been expanded considerably under President Obama. Uh, this man ridiculed me when I suggested that the kind of faith-based financing the Bush administration was promoting would inevitably lead to U.S. taxpayer support for religious proselytizing. But that we now know is exactly what happened abroad. Uh, before the second Bush administration, the U.S. government made it clear that foreign aid for social services, food for the hungry, health classes, all of that kind of thing, must not be accompanied by proselytizing. Bush reversed those policies in a series of executive orders. And one of these was an order of his that struck down longstanding rules requiring religious groups, both here and abroad, to inform beneficiaries that they are not obliged to attend religious services to get the help they need. Food for the Hungry, a group run by Protestant evangelicals, had a policy of preaching about Jesus while teaching new mothers in Africa about breastfeeding and nutrition. Uh, Dr. Clydette Powell, who worked for USAID's Public Health Bureau, staged a workshop here for groups receiving faith-based funding on how to promote religious conversion to Christianity while offering them information about how to stamp out tuberculosis. I think that Christians, Dr. Powell said, have a leg up on the regular public health system because there is an interest in developing a relationship that leads people to know Christ as their savior and true Lord in their lives. I think any American government official who calls herself a Christian should be ashamed of making a statement like this. And if I remember my New Testament correctly, Jesus healed the sick without lecturing them about what they ought to believe. But I am frankly shocked and outraged that a doctor employed by the US government would openly boast about combining proselytizing and medical care financed by my tax dollars, even though I was called an alarmist secularist for predicting exactly this on the panel. If the United States aid is perceived as a tool to convert people to Christianity, this surely cannot be helpful in a world environment in which a great many people are predisposed to believe the worst about America. 
Uh, as a political liberal, I want to emphasize again that the religious left often tries to do this too. In his book, God's Politics, Jim Wallace, a liberal evangelical of growing influence in the Democratic Party, made the astonishing assertion that President Bush had been guilty of bad theology, quote unquote, in his attitudes on war and social justice, and that the answer to this so-called bad theology is not secular government, but good theology. There's just one problem with this. The last time I checked the Constitution, the president was not designated theologian in chief. By good theology, Bush means the biblical interpretation of the Christian left, the Jesus who said, blessed are the peacemakers, and not the Jesus who said, I am come to bring pe not peace but a sword. Make no mistake about it, what we're talking about here is turning political campaigns into a duel of theologies rather than a rational debate about which theology, which public policies make sense for our own citizens and the world. Uh, I should tell you in this context that I actually heard a high official in the Christian coalition. Uh, this was when I was, was speaking at a historical Episcopal college in Roanoke which is not too far from Jerry Falwell's Liberty University. And uh, what they do is they send out a truth posse to follow any specular, secular speakers at nearby colleges in Virginia to sort of boo you if they don't like what you're saying. And after this, I heard a high official in the, in the truth posse, uh, someone who's close to Falwell, was close to Falwell, say she supported the death penalty because, and I quote, this is what she said, and it's a direct quote. Humankind would never have had the opportunity for salvation if the Romans hadn't had the death penalty. How is that for a moral value in public life? How do you think the part of Jesus whom Catholics believe was man as well as God would have felt about that? Now, I can't tell you how often someone comes to, up to me after a, a, a lecture and asks how I can say the framers of the Constitution intended us to have a secular government when in God we trust is written, we trust is written on our currency. I would really like to write a book titled Who's God, Who's Trust, which come to think of it could easily have been the title for my talk today. Uh, the question applies just as strongly to some of the international religio-political issues I've discussed as to our own domestic debates about religion and politics. As an aside, I can't resist telling you exactly how in God we trust made its way onto our currency. In the middle of the Civil War, representatives of the National Reform Association, a group of Protestant ministers, came to Abraham Lincoln and asked him to support a constitutional amendment naming not just God in general, but Jesus Christ in particular as the supreme source of governmental power. Lincoln, canny politician that he was, told the ministers he would, quote, take such action on this proposal as my duty to my maker and my office command. Well, Lincoln had quite a lot on his hands at that time. And the last thing he needed was a controversy about inserting God into the Constitution. So his action was to take no action at all. In 1864, Congress, in a placating gesture, meant to shut these ministers up, added in God we trust to the two penny coin, and the rest is history. Got added to more and more currency as the 19th century went on. When Theodore Roosevelt became president, and he was one of the most devout Christians ever to occupy the office, he tried to get in God we trust taken off the currency because he considered it a sacrilege to put the name of God on money. However, he retreated when he was called an infidel, so God and mammon have coexisted on our dollar bills ever since. A simple matter of political expediency then that has been transformed into a sacred tradition that most people incorrectly believe goes back to the beginning of the republic. We often forget how very close America's founding generation was to the worst horrors of union between church and state. Those were not horrors that belonged to the Middle Ages. The last execution for blasphemy in France took place not in the 13th or 14th centuries, but in 1766, just 10 years before the Declaration of Independence was written. 
This extremely famous case was tried, if the word trial even applies, in Normandy in the town of Abbeville. A crucifix had been defaced, and the young Chevalier de la Barre, who was known in the area for a certain wildness and a propensity for singing anti-clerical songs, was charged with blasphemy. An important piece of evidence of, was his possession of a copy of Voltaire's portable philosophical dictionary. He was sentenced to be burned alive, along with Voltaire's book, by the way, after having his right hand cut off, off and his tongue cut out. He refused to confess, even after being tortured for the final hour before his execution, and the sentence was then carried out. The clerics and the government magistrates, after cutting off the hand, showed mercy by not cutting off his tongue before the auto de fe. And so this was one piece of the international cultural and religious landscape that was very much on the mind of the founders when they left the fateful decision to leave God out of the Constitution. All they'd seen about entanglements between church and state was what that represented. Uh, what is left out of a lot of the discourse today I think is that the tension between secularism and religion has been present since the creation of the American Republic. And it's been a creative tension rather than a destructive tension I believe it's metamorphosed into today. The evangelicals who supported the secular constitution were the spiritual ambassadors of former President Jimmy Carter, a devout Baptist who denounced attempt by, attempts by fundamentalists in Georgia to strike the word evolution from the state high school biology curriculum. But simply talking about the separation of church and state does not address itself to the moral values that secularists, along with men and women of faith who believe in secular government, wish to uphold in our society and public life. In fact, American presidents before 1976 almost never spoke about religion, particularly their personal beliefs in important speeches. Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address is the exception that proves the rule. But Lincoln's observation that both the North and the South pray to the same God while receiving entirely different answers about slavery is hardly an argument for the efficacy of divine guidance or appeals to religion in resolving political conflicts. You would never know it from the sanctimony of politicians today, but reason used to be a word that brought audiences to their feet and not only long ago. I am reminded of the commencement speech delivered at American University by President John F. Kennedy on June 10th, 1963, in which he generally regarded, he announced a policy generally regarded as the beginning of detente with the Soviet Union. He spoke of the need to bring an end to nuclear terror because, quote, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children, and we are all mortal. He described peace as the necessary ends of rational men. Our problems are man-made, he said, and therefore they can be solved by man. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. That speech was surely about moral values. He was saying we owe it to one another to strive for peace, not because we are immortal, but because we are mortal. You can't get much closer to a secular moral statement than that, but it's also a moral statement that could be rooted in any religion. I'm going to close now because I want to leave time for questions and answers. And I would just like to tell you the speech I would like to write for the 2016 presidential candidate, whom I assume will be some sort of Christian or another since the majority of Americans say they would not vote for an atheist. Now, needless to say, no candidate has offered me this job of speech writer, but still, I've told you what, if they did, you would hear from my putative candidate. I stand before you as a candidate for the presidency of the United States, and I believe it is my duty to share my views with you on the proper relation between religion and government. It is an affront both to God and to a free people. Remember, I'm speaking as a Christian now. It is an affront both to God and to a free people for any candidate to claim that you should support his or her policies because God is in favor of those policies. I will never insult your intelligence or your faith by claiming that I or my government speak for the Almighty. I believe in God, and I believe just as deeply in the separation of church and state that was America's founding gift not only to its citizens but to the world. 
Above all, I believe, as the founders of this country believe, that God has given us the gift of reason to solve our earthly problems. I will never allow one form of religion to exercise a veto power over any policy that I believe to be in the best interest of all Americans. Rather, I will emulate Abraham Lincoln, who said in deciding matters he could only judge the plain physical facts of the faith and try to do what appeared to him to be wise and right. Join with me as Americans, whether you are religious believers or religious skeptics or outright atheists, in this great enterprise. I speak of peace, justice, and human rights at home and around the world as the necessary rational ends of all rational men and women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just need my chair. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now it's time for Q and A. Uh, come up to the microphones, and uh, Ms. Jacoby will recognize you in turn while I get a chair for her to relax. <laughs> I'm Mike, so I can have a chair. Thank you. Okay, let's see here. Not trip over the cord, that would be bad. Yes, go ahead. Can you all hear me? It's working, okay, great. Okay. Um, in Ronald Morgan's, is democracy possible? Can you, you need to speak into the microphone. God will get you for that. <laughs> in Ronald Morgan's Is Democracy Possible Here? Do you agree that like, um, the U.S. religion should be settled as a secular... I'm religion? sorry, you're not speaking to the mic and I can barely hear you. Oh, uh, you. You need to speak directly into the mic. Sorry. Uh, do you agree that the U.S. religion should be... Okay. Should be settled as a secular but religious tolerant society. I'm I'm sorry. I'm just it's I'm just not I'm not I'm just not hearing it. Uh, can someone want to adjust this mic in 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 a way that? Do you? Yeah. Can we, yeah. See? See what I'm doing? Do what I do. You just need to speak more loudly. I'm sorry. All right. In Ronald Dworkin's Is Democracy Possible Here? Do you agree with his suggestion that the US religion should be settled as a secular but religious tolerant society or the other way around? Uh, I don't see the US could be a secular and a re religiously tolerant society. I, I read that, I read that actually, and I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, I, I believe we are, we are not a secular society actually, we are a society. People make a, a make a mistake when they talk about this as a Christian nation. We are still a majority Christian people and a more religious people than most other countries. But secular government, yes. Uh, religiously tolerant, yes. I don't see uh, what, what, what conflict there is between them. I think Ronald Dworkin, even though he's a lawyer, made a mistake in the words. What he meant, I think, was secular government, but religiously tolerant society. And he used the word society, which I think is wrong. We're, we're actually, we are in some ways a secular society, but certainly not in all ways. So I don't agree with, with what he wrote as stated, uh, but I don't think he meant it, actually. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't. All right, first oh. of all, can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, so just a little background on myself. I have been born and raised Catholic all my life. I attended Catholic school from kindergarten right up until now. But um, I'm also a philosophy major. I'm hoping I'm to Ooh. go into teaching philosophy. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, but I want to get your perspective as someone who is, you know, atheist, secular, how is it that people who were born and raised and still consider themselves religious, like myself, can reconcile that in what we recognize as we need to have a secular society? How is it that we can reconcile that and still be you know, faithful, 
still be good citizens, etc.? That, you know, that is a question that I am asked when I speak at religious colleges and only at religious colleges. Uh, well, it, it, this is the first time it's ever been asked as a, at a Catholic college, though. Usually I'm asked this by someone who was raised in a fundamentalist Protestant home with a, yeah, with a rigid biblical interpretation of the Bible, which of course is not the way that Catholics are, are raised. Uh, I think in fact it poses less of a problem for a Catholic. I don't think, for instance, you cannot be a religious fundamentalist, that is, believe in a, in a literal interpretation of every word in the Bible, and, and believe in secular government. I think, I think, however, that being both religious and being, in, being a believer and a citizen of a secular government, you will often have, there will be issues that come up. They come up every day, whether it's about, uh, about the, the, you, the distribution of contraceptives in Catholic hospitals, or a physician-assisted suicide to take a completely other you know, decision at the other end of life, where you're going to have to decide uh, whether the religious value you have or had is more important than, than the secular value, which is certainly that people who aren't Catholics should not be deprived, uh, you know, who, or, or who aren't Catholics who don't believe in contraception. Catholics and Catholics who don't believe in contraception are not the same thing, as we know. Uh, but I think anybody who is religious, and I think that probably applies to every religion, has to decide when those issues come in conflict on, on what point, I'm sure, that every Catholic politician, I'm sure that pro-choice Catholic politicians like, say, Vice President Joe Biden, uh, I'm sure every year of his political life some issue has come up like that. And there would be no way it would be arrogant and stupid for me to say to you that, there, that these things are easily recognizable. Because there are actually very few religions in which sometimes uh, there doesn't come up some conflict. I mean, indeed, there, there, there are few moral values in which that, that sometimes don't come into conflict that what's demanded of you on a job or if your job were being a politician, a politician. So I don't know. I would say it would have to, it would have to take a long time and, and a lifetime, really, and it's not probably anything you can decide once. And someone who asked this, me this question at a Lutheran college much more painfully because, because this young man was brought up in a fundamentalist Lutheran home, the kind of biblically literal home in which every word in the Bible was literally true. And if the Bible said seven days, by God, it means seven days. And that's not Catholicism. But he said, I know what you're saying, that, that, that we have a society in which everyone has the right to believe what they want. But he said, I know the truth. And how since I, and he used the word know very deliberately, not the word believe. I know the truth. And how not knowing the truth can I not want other people to have that? And, and I said to him, I'll tell you, that was the first time I'd been asked that question. So I didn't have any, any answer in my head. And I said, well, uh, if you know the truth, but you know that other people don't think you know the truth, the truth they know is different. I, I said, it is probably going to take you a lifetime to try how to balance that. And the interesting thing about this was, is Augustana colleges to Lutheranism as colleges like this are to Catholicism, which is, first of all, by no means are all of the faculty Lutheran. By no means, in fact, a third of the students at Augustana are Catholics, which really surprised me. But uh, he was genuinely troubled, but he'd already, in his first year at Augustana, he'd wanted to be a minister. Now he just wanted to be a high school teacher. And what I saw as a young man, that, that his, he was learning new things. He was learning about a kind of Lutheranism he had never learned about before. As anybody, sometimes people are brought up in a religion, but often they're not taught about the history of their religion or any other. And the more you learn about the history of religion, I think the more people think about these conflicts. And I'm not going to say to him 
that's not a resolvable conflict for you. I think it is for you because, because Catholic tradition does not require you to believe that the earth was created in seven days. He's not going to be able to believe in science and democracy and continue to believe that if he still did believe that the world was created in seven days. But it is not my place to tell someone who is troubled that. Yes. Um, all right. Oh, that seemed really loud. Um, so I guess I just wanted to get your perspective on we are still largely a Christian nation and lots of people still believe in religion, but there's been a rising number of people who identify as atheists in the past century and couple decades. So um, I was just wondering what you thought contributed to this trend. Uh, well, first of all, there's been a rising number of people who identify themselves as unaffiliated in the last few decades. They're, they're about one out of every five Americans, and the younger people are, the more they tend to identify as unaffiliated. There has been a slight increase in people who identify as atheists, but it's only uh, of the 20% of Americans who say they are not affiliated with any particular religion, only 1.6 say that they're atheists. Which is why, now, I think in fact that a lot more of those people really are atheists than will admit it, because uh, really atheism, there's a strong pejorative attached to atheism. So it is a lot easier even to say you're an agnostic or to say that you're nothing in particular. But unfortunately, and I think for the secular movement, this is, this is a real problem, unfortunately, I'm not a secularist to crow over this 20% statistic, even though the number has doubled. Because I think a lot of the people who say, who identify, and when asked by the Pew Forum, which is kind of the gold standard of research for religion and public life, uh, the majority of people who were unaffiliated said they're, they're not, they call themselves nothing in particular. Well, I'm not sure as someone who is a part of the secular movement, that nothing in particular is a very good basis for a secular movement. I, I will tell you that the nothing in particulars who are, have been abbreviated to be the nuns, and oh, and yes, not and you and us, obviously. Uh, I think a lot of the reason for the increase in that is the fact is that we are literally not a country that practice what we preaches, what we preach. A lot of these nuns are people who've had no religion, religious education all, at all. It can't possibly be that 50% of Americans tell the Pew researchers that they don't, can't name the four gospels. Some of those are people who probably call themselves Christians. If you don't know the names of the four gospels, and 45% of American Jews don't know that Maimonides was Jewish, the greatest Jewish philosopher and Talmudic scholar in Jewish history. Uh, there has been a loss of religious knowledge, which is part, I think, of a general educational problem. And so that saying you're nothing in particular uh, may mean that you don't want to say you don't believe in God. Maybe even you haven't thought through whether you believe in God or not. But what you don't want are the obligations that are attached to a traditional religion. Don't want to have to go to church every Sunday instead of the shopping mall. Don't have to want to put that money in the collection plate. Don't have to want to actually learn anything beyond uh, Santa and, and the secular Christmas carols. Uh, don't want to do anything except go home if you're a Jew and sit at the Passover table. But you don't know what those people singing things in Hebrew are saying. And so I, I think that, that as a secularist and an atheist, I approach these figures with caution. Because while there are more atheists, and there are there are more people like me. They're not very many, a very small minority. And I'm not sure that the nuns are a healthy de religious development. I'm not sure. All right, thank you. Um, so one time I was watching a news segment after the Supreme Court's ruling on DOMA, which brought it back to the state level. And there was two contributors on this new segment. One was a Fox News contributor who was a gay rights like activist. And the other one, Ryan T. Anderson from the Heritage Foundation, was against it. And at the end of the segment, the Fox News contributor said that this isn't a popularity contest. What's right is right. 
while Ryan T. Anderson was um, advocating that the people should decide on it. So in a secular government, is it a popularity contest or is there some sort of um, right and wrong that says what is right is right and what's wrong is wrong? Or does it go to the people and is it then basically a popularity contest? Good question. Uh, I think there are some things, as a person, I think there are some things that, in which right is right and wrong is wrong, and we have them. We have the Bill of Rights, in fact, and so I, I'll play devil's advocate here. We have the Bill of Rights, which in fact says that there are certain principles so important, such as freedom of speech and freedom of religion, that they're not to be decided by majority vote uh, at all. And we're talking about votes here. Uh, the Supreme Court didn't say it had to be voted on, it said they really left it for the lower court. Uh, but we, we do, in fact, have a Bill of Rights which says some principles are so fundamental, and this is not, uh, you know, this is not moral in the sense of talking about sin, but we do in a secular way in the Bill of Rights say that there are some principles that are so important that they're not to be decided by majority vote. But what does change, and it's something that's very important in Supreme Court decisions, and it's why the Supreme Court, some of those people on the Supreme Court probably personally don't approve of gay marriage at all, but the Supreme Court decisions do reflect changing community standards, and in that respect, on certain issues, gay rights is certainly one of them. If you had told me 10 years ago that Americans would have changed their views on gay marriage as, as much as they clearly have, I would have said it would be impossible for something to change that path. I have my ideas on why that's so, but I, I don't think you know, there's time since there are other people for questions. But I think the question is not whether there are some things that are right or wrong, but whether, whether, but whether a guy from the Heritage Foundation's idea of right and wrong is, is what the Supreme Court or, or, or other people should think is right or wrong. I think it's quite clear that there are only a few things. Uh, murder is one of them, but even then, the question is not all societies have prohibition against murder, both secular and religious, but they don't agree on what murder is. For instance, many people do not think that physician-assisted suicide for somebody who's in terrible pain is murder. Uh, they just they define it as, as, as something else entirely. Many people believe abortion is murder, many people don't. So I think in any case in a society that we're not talking about a popularity contest, we are talking about an issue in which, and it is not wrong, and it, it doesn't mean that there is no such thing as moral truth, but in a democracy, you've got to be pretty careful about applying one religion's or one person's idea of, of moral truth because, look, people, including Christians and Jews, thought that slavery was just fine for most of human history. Read the Bible. Uh, the story of Exodus is the classic anti-slavery narrative, and what happens after Exodus as the Jews fight their way back into the promised land? They force people to convert or kill them, and they take slaves, people of other religions, Christians, until well after the Renaissance, owned slaves. Jews in the Roman Empire owned slaves, just as Romans did. And yet we have changed our minds about slavery. So in that respect, I, I think, yes, certain issues are, in a sense, a popularity contest. But I wouldn't call it. I would say that as a political liberal, I believe that on some issues, and slavery is one of them, and, and I, I actually think gay rights is another, People come to see the truth more fully and come to a consensus about it that's different than people did 2,000 years ago. Those guys out in the middle of the desert think they're doing God's work. Uh, they, they think that there, there's no such thing as, as, as a popularity contest. They're going to be had people who don't agree with them, and that's that. Equivocal answer, I know. But, but I don't think popularity contest was the right word for that guy from the Heritage Foundation to to use, uh, and I don't think that there is anything morally wrong with people coming to a different moral consensus about all kinds of issues uh, over time. I was gonna say, can I make one comment? It was actually, what was interesting about it was it was the Fox News contributor who was the gay rights activist that said that. Yeah. So it was kind of like the flip, right. uh, which was interesting, but I think. Right, right, but Heritage Foundation is much worse. 
Uh, yeah. I definitely agree. Uh, I was wondering if you could think out loud about the possibility of linking one of the signature achievements of Enlightenment thought, namely the separation of religion from politics or church from state, to the dominant social institution of our own time, which is not so much the church anymore, but the corporation. Because if you think about it, the corporation has almost sacred power over our life today, it has an organizing dogma, namely the divine right of capital. It has a priestly caste, the corporate boardroom, the CEOs, and it has a uh, set of sacred texts, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist. Okay, okay, <laughs> um, okay. So uh, if, if some of the, the intellectual energy that was driving the environment- Occupy Lake Superior. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh, but it seems to me that might be one of the challenges of our time is to separate the state from the corporation, especially in light of the Citizens United case. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts I, I'm on not, that. I'm not going to think out loud about that because I know that's not what people came to hear. Uh, I, I am a political liberal, however, uh, I, and corporations do have a lot of power. But I really, I really don't want to think out loud about that because I think it, I think it's way, it's way off topic. You can't occupy Lake Superior, can you? I found that this morning. Uh, I, I wondered why aren't, why aren't people walking by the lake? I brought my workout clothes, and then I put my head out <laughs> and felt the wind, and I, and I realized why they weren't. But actually, that would make an interesting essay. Yeah. And I know that's that's really a that's really a. A, an evasive answer, but I really don't think that's what people came to talk about tonight. Hi. Uh, so you talked about um, Islamic terrorism as painted by the media, um, in the U.S. anyway, and uh, sort of the religious force behind that. And um, I was just wondering if you knew or thought there was sort of like a, not necessarily terrorism, but like a, maybe a religious oppression going on somewhere else in the world that's maybe underrepresented in the media? Uh, well, yeah, there, there, there. I mean, certainly there is persecution of both Christians and Buddhists in China, uh, which, which I think it has received a bit more attention in the media recently, uh, but, but not a lot. The Chinese don't behead Christians and Buddhists; they just put them in prison. There tends to be a hierarchy, a hierarchy of interests. The more, the more violent, the more. And, and, and also, the, the greatest persecution of Christians is going on in the Islamic parts of the Middle East right now. But there is certainly, and there is persecution of non-Russian Orthodox people under Vladimir Putin, who has rediscovered, in spite of his KGB background, the joys of calling on traditional religion in the service of the state. The only traditional religion, you know, he appears with Russian Orthodox patriarchs all the time. Uh, just as the czars did, it's, it's been quite fascinating. There is also in both England, in Indonesia and Bangladesh, persecutions of, persecution of free thinkers and atheists. An atheist was just released from prison in Indonesia for joining an atheist faith group, Facebook group uh, started by Indonesian immigrants in the Netherlands and expressing, he was brought up in a devout Muslim home and expressing his doubts about the, about the existence of God he was put in jail for, for defaming other religions. In other words, under Indonesian law, they recognized six religions. Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Confucianism, not Judaism. And, and atheism is actually, it's actually forbidden. So, and and there, there's a large emigration. There is, you may or may not know, quite a significant free-thinking tradition in both Bangladesh and India. India does not persecute free-thinkers and atheists, but Bangladesh does. So, and I think all of those are underrepresented in the media. The media tends to go for whatever the most dr dramatic things are. You know, just, to, just, to, just as we're hearing Ebola, 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 even though people are dying all over the world from malnutrition, much larger numbers even than from Ebola in Africa every day. Hi, uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, my question is about sort of a little detail because I'm, a, I'm an atheist and I'm secular, so obviously I agree with your general message that 
politics and religion mixing is unconstitutional. But my question is about something you said. You said that all atheists are secular. But I think it's an important distinction that um, atheism and theism or the belief in God is distinct from religion. I don't think belief in a God is necessarily tied to a religion. Um, for example, you could be a Hindu, have a religion, you could believe in reincarnation, but you could still be an atheist. That's nonsense. Hindus are not atheists. They can be, yes. Lots of Buddhists and Hindus don't believe in any god. No, 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 that's not true. They don't believe in a conventional, I, I would argue with you about your religious knowledge. They, Hinduism, and, and now, I'm not saying there might not be somebody who calls themselves a Buddhist who doesn't believe in a god. They don't believe in a monotheistic god who rewards and punishes in the traditional Jewish or the very traditional Christian sense, but they do believe in, in a being larger than themselves, more in the sense that the American founding deists believed in providence. The, the, the founders were not atheists in the sense that you and I are. And I have never met a Buddhist or a Hindu who didn't believe in some kind of an overarching guiding power. It isn't, I would agree with you, it's not a, a, a kind of monotheistic God we're used to thinking about in the United States and Western culture. But I think that most Hindus and Buddhists would argue with you strenuously that they are, that they are atheists. In fact, I, 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 I have a good friend who is, who is a Buddhist, and uh, in a dedication to his most recent book, he thanked the Buddha for sending him such good women friends. Well, I was really mad at him. But, but to him, the Buddha represents a sort of guiding spirit. Uh, but he is definitely not an atheist. He believes, he believes something else, that there is a plan to the universe. And, and I think the randomness of things in the universe, to me, is, is part of, of part of atheism. I don't, many Buddhists and Hindus believe everything happens for a reason. I don't believe that. I think lots of things happen for no reason at all. It's one of the non-comforts of, of atheism. But I simply don't agree with you, and if there were a professor of Hindu studies or, and Buddhist studies in the audience, I don't think they would agree with you that Hindus and Buddhists are atheists either. Well, my only point was that they can be and that the two things aren't necessarily tied. Because I, I have met atheist Hindus. Well, I, do exist. Well, well, all I can say is, is if I met an atheist Hindu, I would say that they are people, the young man who asked sort of the first question here about reconciling his Catholic upbringing with, uh, you know, with, with his views on secular government and that task, I would say that people who say, I'm an atheist and a Hindu, as opposed to, I believe in secular government and I'm a Hindu of whom there are many. But that's not the same thing. I would say someone who says I'm an atheist and a Hindu isn't willing to face up to contradictions between certain kinds of beliefs. That's what I would say and I do. Okay, him first, then you. Hi, um, considering the, the talk today was on is religion good for politics, I guess the question I would have is not necessarily religion, but now given like what's going on in North Korea where they just released the gentleman who left his Bible in the hotel, but he was considered a terrorist. Yeah. And so you have a regime that's a complete atheist. Like now they have other things going on besides just their non-belief in, in God, but they have a dictatorship issue going on as well. So I guess the question is, Maybe not is religion good for politics, but is un, the unwillingness to see someone else's point of view what is particularly bad for politics? I am really glad you asked that question because one of the most frequent things that's said to atheists is atheism is just another religion. No, it's not. But this incident from Korea is a great example of something. There are secular ideologies. And actually, North Korea is the perfect modern example. There are sec when a secular ideology is impervious to evidence, which to me is the, the essence of religion, which it believes in things that cannot be proved. And some religions, not all, but some religions believe in things that can positively be disproved. In other words, they are impervious to all evidence. Soviet communism under Stalin, 
North Korean communism under those guys, <laughs> including the one who disappeared for, for quite a while, is impervious to evidence. North Korea is one of the poorest countries in the world. The, if you will, the relief of that kind of status, the relief of that kind of status communism was that communism, that is to say under Stalin and now under the rulers of North Korea, would bring about a better life for people. But manifestly, it does not. All you have to do is look at North Korea versus South Korea. In other words, it's an unusual place where the evidence is close as hand. This is a system by, by any normal rules of evidence that doesn't work. And any secular system that defies evidence and, and simply and is not evidence-based is like a religion. That's not what atheism is. But it's what atheism, as you said, atheism is only part of what the North Koreans are doing. It's atheism tied to violence. It's atheism tied to the idea of one ruler being a secular god. And anybody who defies that secular god is to be imprisoned or killed. And that is like a religion. That has nothing more to do with atheism than my Pakistani grocer has to do with those awful guys who I'm convinced partly that, that they're all guys wherever they come from. Most of them come from the neighboring lands who, who like a lot of the crusaders, uh, really just couldn't adjust to the society in, in which they live. Do you think that anybody in the 10th century went running off to Jerusalem if, if he had a nice pretty wife and, and children he loved and a plot of ground you know, that he was getting food on? Do you think any of these guys are anything but losers in the societies from which they came. No, they, they aren't. And they've got, they've got this ideology to justify lives that aren't working. Just like, just like, you know, all of the nice Christian men in Europe stayed home during the Crusades. <laughs> you know, they didn't wake up one morning, listen to Pope Urban and say, hmm, I should definitely run off to Jerusalem and retake the Holy Land. And on the way, I'm going to burn and kill and force convert a lot of Jews just to practice. Uh, but no, a North Korean state ideology is like a religion. And by the way, I'm going to give the Occupy Lake Superior guys something to go home with, which is that uh, there are people, for instance, who believe in the market economy as a religion. Like I'm, I know people who believe in Ayn Rand's objectivism, which is about, has as much to do with, again, is about as impervious to evidence as anything can get. If you believe in a, it's a secular ideology, which of course the people like Rand, you know who he was named for, Paul, ignore because of course they're Christians, so they have to forget that he was an atheist. But I know we're running out of time. Got to get to you. Thank you Last question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just want to say that first. I attended the first lecture um, when it talked about the most popular religion in America is probably American nationalism. Like if you ask people, would, would they kill for America versus would they kill for Jesus? And I think I've noticed a trend where people are aware of kind of the negative um, aspects of religion. They, some, a lot of people seek distance from themselves for that when they say, say non-affiliated or they say, you know, I'm just believe in God or whatever. Do you, and I feel like as a nation we all need, and I think people want to strive for more humanistic values and uh, policies and politics that focus on truth and reason, but would you say that's correct? Uh, the, 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 if I understand your question, that a lot of people who are unaffiliated are just turned off specific religious practices and ideas and that they want to strive for humanistic values in another way? Well, I know Christians who are super devout and have are, are incredible um, strive for you know liberal tendencies and are part of the LGBT movement as well as Jews and Muslims and I feel like people as a whole like of who identify as being religious or even just you know unaffiliated are striving towards humanistic tendencies. Would you say that's true? I don't know. Uh, I know that some of the unaffiliated are are not just are not liberal uh, and it's interesting. They don't identify themselves as humanists either. It's kind of a word that's sort of gone out of fashion. Uh, I would like to think that most of the people who say nothing in particular 
are part of a group striving for humanistic values, but I have to say that I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I do think, I do think that one of the things, I didn't say this earlier, the rise in the people who aren't affiliated with any religion isn't just mental laziness or, or lack of education about religious traditions. It is also that obviously religion has failed to meet certain needs of them. And I think also, they don't, as you're talking about you know, movements for anything from women priests in the Catholic Church to women rabbis much more successful within Judaism to recognition in many religions for LGBT rights, those are all people who are engaged in the process of trying to reconcile their religion with humanistic values that their religion has not traditionally supported. And that's another thing. I'm just not, I'm not sure. I'm really, I'm really not sure whether the secular movement consists mostly of people like that or not. I'm sure that, I'm sure that among the percentage who call themselves atheists and agnostics, they do. I mean, one of our whole points is that, uh, is that, is that human, humanistic values derive from all kinds of universal imperatives about what we owe one another to have decent lives, and they don't have to derive from a traditional idea system of rewards and punishments. I think that's all. Thank you, you've been a great audience. I, I just want to get my sure, some water you. before I... Thank you for, for your talk. Thank you. Well, there's more water out there, too. Okay. And uh, so thank you all again for coming. Uh, we do have a reception out in the foyer, as we usually do, and we may even have a few books to sell if you're interested. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>